I'm kind of wondering, um, uh, um, you know, like, like it takes a long time to get a vineyard going. You know, it's like, like, like I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying to picture like those finances must have been kind of tight like those first years. There weren't any finances. We did this <clears throat> by the seat of our pants. I learned early on that bankers weren't going to lend me money. That's why we were in a converted turkey processing plant. It's now the turkey shed. <laughs> um, and I just gave up using bankers, which turned out to be a very wonderful thing because I learned if I'm going to get it, I'm going to have to pay cash for it. And that's what we did when we could afford something and still be able to eat. We bought it. Yeah. And that's kept this place pretty solid. So like those first years, um, did you continue working for like the, um, the book company or? Until 73 and then it got to be too much of a push of kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It was just getting too tough to be doing traveling and doing a good job on that and running the vineyard. So what, um, you know, what do you see, like from where you're sitting right now, what do you see as the future of Oregon uh, wine? And how does it look out there in the future? Well, I think there are aspects of Oregon wine that are totally exciting. I mean, what we've created here, myself and a lot of other people, have created from pretty much nothing. I mean, the people that started this industry They were rolling their dice too, for the most part. They maybe had some parental bucks here and there, but I had $10,000 from my mother. So that bought the original property. Uh, there's some new money coming in here. Um, and a lot of those people will be successful. Because but they've got money for marketing and that sort of thing, or? I don't think so. I mean, I market wine, and that wine is something I make and make well. And I've always had the feeling that, that if you make something that tastes good, wine in this case, they're going to do well. Yeah. And we've done well over the last 40 years. It's better. And so when you look out in the future, um, oh, let's say, you know, 10 years from now, or, you know, like you've got this tremendous perspective of history up to this point, you know, and when you look out to the future, what, what do you see? You know, do, like what kind of growth, what, uh, you know, what do you see? I think I see a lot of younger people coming in here. Some of them financed properly, some of them not. But all of them very idealistic. A lot of them carry the same ideals that we did coming up here. And that's very healthy. That's, you know, my son Jason may be on a gravy train, but he works his butt off. He's working 60 hours a day here, a month, a week here. Yeah. And that's no free ride for him. He has my knowledge for what it's worth, but being young, he'd like to make that <laughs> his innovation, which is okay with me. You're okay with that? Yeah. 
No, he's doing some things out in the vineyard that I never thought of. Like? Well, we use sulfur in the vineyard for years because uh -huh. we don't we don't use uh, um, pesticides, heavy duty mildewicides. We just don't use that crap. Yeah. I mean, there's stuff out there you spray for mildew, and we sprayed for sulfur, with sulfur for years. Yeah. And Jason came up with this thing about using sulfur, certainly, but with an adjunct of milk, and it works terrifically. Huh. And like milk is like, are you using like powdered milk then, or what? Uh... Yeah. Hmm. I think it's a way. I say I think it is, because I don't even question that because it has worked so well. Huh. It's just so he's willing to get out and experiment and use new things and. Yeah. Feels good. So that feels good for you that he yeah. that he's doing that. You bet. Yeah. Does it kind of remind you of like when you came out here at the, you know, twenty five and you were experimenting with all this stuff? Yeah, it does. But the difference is, I just plain knew that sulfur was going to be good and low impact. And I didn't want to screw around with Mother Nature. You know, people talk about organic and booga booga, what's, uh, what's, it, what's it called? Biodynamic. Biodynamics uh -huh. and what have you. And that's just always been a philosophy of life for me. When I used to go hiking up in the Wasatch Mountains, I'd carry an empty burlap bag and fill it with I shouldn't say this about Utah. Fill it with beer cans and take them down out of the hills. Yeah. You know, just I have a respect for nature. Yeah. So that's one half. The younger generation coming in here. Want to get that? No. I said it'll just ring here in just a minute. So we'll just let it go. So, what? You know what? What do you think are the like the biggest issues? Mm -hmm. Looks like it's five to two. Wait a minute. Did I slip an hour on here? I've been having an enjoyable conversation with you. Do you need to take off? I don't know. I might have slipped that thing by an hour. biggest issues that you have to deal with with growing, you know, uh, grapes here in the Willamette? The weather. The weather. So it's a positive and the negative. What's the negative? The negative is if it rains at the wrong time, you're had. Yeah. Uh, the positive, of course, is in having great wines that come out of here. Um, I 
Back yonder. Oh, okay. You asked me about the what I felt was going to happen with the Willamette Valley and so on. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the younger generation, and I'd just like to finish that. And there are also, besides the young generation, there are a lot of people who have made their money in outside industry and so on who poured a lot of money into this industry to its it's been a positive influence um, I, don't know, I don't know how to put it genteelly um, don't worry about being genteel don't put it in print. All right. <laughs> um, I don't know. Let me just sum summarize it with the people from outside who have the big bucks. And that is, they're never going to have the fun that I've had. Hmm. You know, there are people that come in and they can throw all sorts of bucks at a piece of land or a, a winery site or what have you. They can afford it. And I, at times, I envy them, but at other times I love being in this building. And people walk into this building and say, particularly Europeans, and say, this is like, a cellar at home. And that makes me feel good. <laughs> but I just think that they're they're not having as much fun as we are. Uh -huh. Because like you went, you know, like yours was a, a trail full of struggles. You could say that. Yeah. So when you when you think about like the years that you've spent, you know, doing winemaking, you know, and and being in the vineyard, it's like what would you think was like like the highest moment that you had, like you know, just some euphoric moment that you just think, oh, this is so incredible, this is really working. I just love this. Well, that would have been after the Duran tasting. That really made us. Uh huh. To be recognized by like world class. There were damn peasants out here in Oregon for Pete's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and we became upstart peasants. Yeah. What about what was a, a moment that was just like you know something happened and or maybe a series of things happened and you just said oh gosh is this worth it I mean. What, what, is this worth it? You mean the common hours? You know, just something that was like, you know, just made you kind of question, uh, you know, if like all this work that you're doing, if it was worth it. If, you know, something, uh, you know, it could be uh, a freeze or, you know, things happen. You know, things happen, and, and uh, you know, it's like there's, there's got to have been times when you just got discouraged. I think that probably falls into the realm of marketing, and that is that <clears throat> wines have since the mid 80s become these monsters they're oaky they're dark color they're high in alcohol they don't taste like Pinot Noir 
Huh. And it's discouraging to see Pinot Noir go that way because I have a feeling of Pinot Noir, right or wrong, I have the feeling that Pinot Noir should be something to love, as I said at the beginning. And it hasn't gone that way in the present years. And that's disappointing. I hate to see what I started here turn into California. Uh -huh. I mean, I can go down to California and get five, eight tons to the acre. <laughs> and make that kind of wines. And then you get big scores, and then you get big prices. And then you get, you know, adoration from the masses for all 95 cases you produce. That's kind of frustrating. Huh. So, like, I don't like, think I'm right all the time, but I think I'm right in my knowledge of Pinot Noir. I think I know what I'm doing with Pinot Noir. And I hate to see it turn into this slot. Huh, that's interesting. And it, it's like, I'm hearing you. I hate to say, you know, I'm hearing you talk lots about California. Um, yeah, strike that. <laughs> okay, it, it's like... Uh, That's like here, it, too. Uh -huh. It's in Oregon, California, Canada, you name it. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's where people want to get, make a big wine for the palate of Americans, which is bigger is better. Bigger in terms of... More of everything. More alcohol, more oak, more color, more everything that is not, to me, what defines Pinot Noir. And that's a sort of diaphanous A woman you want to dance with instead of sumo wrestle with. <laughs> <laughs> nice image. <laughs> so you were saying you, you kind of like the subtlety, huh? <laughs> Very much. And what is it, you know, what is it that, um, you know, gives it that subtlety? And I, we've talked a little bit about this, and I guess I'm, I'm kind of looking, you know, I want to make sure I understand it. When you do, would you let me know? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've been, you've been doing it for a long time, you know, and you obviously have a good relationship, you know, with uh, the woman. And... Um, you know, it's like you know how to make, um, you know how to sing to it, or you know how to allow it to sing. So what is it that, uh, you know, what are the, the things that allows, like the, like, the fruit to sing in the wine? I think treat it, treat it gently. In terms of production, you mean, or... Most certainly in the terms of production. <clears throat> in its production, it shouldn't be machine-made. It should be what comes off the bind. What you're given off the bind is what Pinot Noir is. And, you know, horror be that it might be a lighter weight Pinot Noir one year than another year. And I've made just about the range of them. And they all never fail to excite me. They're, they're fun and they're coy and they have little things that come out. Like our 84 vintage was just
kind of a nasty little person because we had a absolutely horrible year. It started raining, I don't know when, I think in September and didn't quit until March. It was the year of the pink pinot here. Mm. Pink and <laughs> what? <laughs> no, everyone. There were two of us that made uh, red pinot. And I had just gotten a new crusher stemmer. And I could get whole clusters through it. Huh. And I thought, I'm going to try this sucker and see if it works. And it did. And I just remembered something correlative to yesterday. Mm -hmm. 1984. Uh -huh. That was the year we first used the Amos. Yeah. First used the what? Amos. That's the, the name of the crusher uh -huh. Yeah, I was picking Dad's brain yesterday about whether or not we changed from a... Jason, is there a chance I can get you to come sit over here closer to the mic so I can pick you up? I have a terrible memory, and if I don't record it, it... Uh, oh, you can move that stuff. Because if I don't record it, it's, it's history. Well, I don't know that I want you to record this. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you'll actually have final say in what goes in, and so... Yeah, we might be delving into trade secrets here. <laughs> we we had a we had a crusher stemmer that was more aggressive, uh -huh. and uh, we we uh, we traded that out for one that's very gentle, does a really nice job, gives us a nice big pile of whole berries. But I was asking Dad whether he thought that changed the wine style at all. Well, to partially continue that conversation. I think it saved our ass in 1984. Mm -hmm. It was a tough year. I mean, there was no question. Because of all the, the, the moisture, all the... Oh, God, it was muddying them out, and it was just a nasty year. It was our vineyard foreman's first year. He said, oh, God. I don't know what I want to do one of these again. <laughs> Javier, yeah, he was a 16-year-old kid and that vintage wore him out. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. So now, Jason, when did you, like, start being interested in, uh, in viticulture, winemaking? Hmm. Well, it was a family business, so I'm not sure that I had any choice. There's actually quite a few families that, you know, like kids are making conscious decisions not to be uh, part of, you know, the, the family business. Well, I did that for a while. Um, pretty much from the time I graduated high school, except for some, you know, just times when Dad needed help or I needed pocket money, um, I was working elsewhere and doing other things, so... That changed in 97 when I came back more seriously. But then, I don't know, we didn't, we didn't start off on the right foot that time around. So I went off and did other things for a while longer and then came back. So what pulled you back that, that first time? I mean, I had just gotten a degree in botany and was spending a lot of time, um, you know, taking leaf chlorophyll measurements and uh, measuring leaves and counting seeds and... Uh, uh, running them all through statistical matrices to see what it all what it all showed, uh -huh. and uh, what it all showed is that plants are really smart. <laughs> smart in terms of like adaptation. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. It 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 proves that you don't necessarily need a brain to uh, uh, be a very strategic organism, you know, and uh, uh, you know. To me, the sort of variety of adaptations that plants have made to their environment is sort of just the, uh, well, starting with that just amazing miracle of photosynthesis to begin with. You take water and carbon dioxide gas and sunlight, and uh, you bounce it around in this electron chain and it turns into sugar. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's very yeah. cool. So, do you want one? 
I don't know, that looks pretty serious. <laughs> I don't know if I'm man enough. <laughs> Thank you. Is that an impeachment or an indictment? <laughs> I think this is an indictment. Uh -huh. um, so I, I came back just to work a harvest and, and to show... I'm not sure why I came back to tell you the truth. I think it just seemed like something kind of fun to do after after I graduated college. Something practical, like you had all this theory, and so... I know, it's more like, you know, I haven't done this for a while. Uh -huh. Let's go back and see what it's like. My wife... Yeah, that's the year we got married. Um, my wife, uh, you know, was loved Ivory Wines, and, and uh, so we decided to come back and work a harvest and we both had a great time mm -hmm. and uh, so we decided to move back up here in nine, and so that's what we did in 98 from from New Mexico uh -huh. uh -huh. but I, I think the draw was for me that um, statistics are a pretty um, limited lens or a, a limited way in which to view exactly how incredible plants are. <laughs> so, uh, wine is a much more intuitive hmm. interaction between humans and plants than statistics. So it sounds like on this first trip, though, like it didn't quite work out. There must have been some kind of conflict or something, or oh well, it didn't work out because I had a job waiting for me back in New Mexico. So in uh, in '97, uh -huh. after the harvest, we just went back, and um, uh, you know, Diane finished up her appointment, and I finished up my appointment, and then we moved back up. Uh -huh. I was working for a great lab down there, but. Um, the woman who was running it had decided to move back to the East Coast, and the, the postdoc who was there moved on to a uh, faculty position. So that was kind of wrapping up, and it just seemed like a nice little kind of coda to that period of life, and so decided to move back up. Uh -huh. And and like what you know when you're thinking like okay I'm going to be moving back up, like what were your um, hopes? I guess is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. I really didn't want to see, I wanted to see the family land stay in family hands. I mean, I grew up, I grew up running around those vineyards, and um, I think this is probably true of a lot of farm kids. You, you grow up on a piece of land, and, and you uh, become pretty attached to it. And so that was, that was my first goal, and that's always kind of been in the back of my mind, is something that I wanted to see happen. And I figured if I didn't show up and um, make that uh, make that clear that that wasn't guaranteed to happen. Yeah. So that's one reason I came back. So here I are. That's here we are. Yeah. <laughs> and so, what was your thought? You know, like when he came back, like that that second time, and he had, you know, um, he wanted. Sounds like you wanted to stay, and, and you wanted to be some part of, you know, of the, uh, of the process. Well, I think like most, you know, the problem is that I know everything. <laughs> the other problem is that he knows everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's funny because he said the same thing. <laughs> I wasn't using you to say it about him. Yeah. <laughs> I was saying it about me when I was well, coming up here. You, you know, twenty-five years old and knew everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, I I just come out of a science background. I was ready to experiment. You know? uh -huh. And uh, he's been doing this for forty years. He's done all the experiments. You know, it's like we were talking yesterday about whole cluster fermentation. And I'm trying to pick his brain about it because I know he's done it. He's done everything. Everything I think that I've come up with. You know, I look in the cellar somewhere and there's, you know, a bottle labeled experiment. You know, 
Wild Yeast Chardonnay, 1974. <laughs> 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 but, you know, he's already done all that, and, and so he was sort of past that stage, and I was really coming into it. And so, um, I don't know, just, just things like that. There was no sort of, like, big falling out or anything. It was just sort of a series of small frictions, and it just seemed like it would be easier for both of us if he still wanted wanted to make wine and grow grapes. Yeah. And, uh, you know. It just seemed easier for both of us if I, you know, at, at that point in our lives, I had more career options than he did. <laughs> so it made more sense for me to go off and do other things for a while. Yeah. And so then you went off and did... Um, I worked for Oregon State University for a while in their fruit and berry research program uh -huh. on uh, breeding and plant diseases and um, uh, cultivar, you know, just sort of the whole... Actually, part of that job was just part appeal to my practical farmer side because it was growing, it was growing berries. Uh -huh. So there was a lot of tractor driving and you know hoeing and spraying and sort of uh, you know uh, watering and and uh, you know, fidgeting about harvest and scaring birds away and all the stuff I'd grown up doing. Uh huh. So <laughs> it was it was a pretty natural fit, and there was that science side too. So I did that for a while, but you know I also learned that unless you're going to go get a PhD, that uh, you know, we had my first kid while I had that job, and I realized I cannot support my family doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, just uh, $9 an hour isn't going to cut it, so. Um, then I took a job, because you know, appealing to another hobby of mine, which was woodworking, uh, working for a gentleman who uh, makes sort of a very specialized set of educational materials for Montessori schools. Hmm. And uh, he, he developed some really innovative uh, uh, interpretations of some of Maria Montessori's basic tools. And, you know, within that world, he's, he's, he's a real hot shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, he's a superb craftsman, so I really enjoyed working with him. Mm -hmm. We did that for a while, and then, let's see, 2002 came along. And I have, a, I have a friend who's got a winery on the other side of town, and he was bugging me. He said, Jason, you know, you really should make wine again. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I've, I've done that. I've dragged hoses. I've, you know, cleaned up presses at 3 in the morning. I've done all that. I don't need to do that anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he said, no, you should give it a try. I'll, I'll loan you the fruit. I'll loan you the labor. I'll loan you the equipment. Wow. You, all you have to do, if you want, is just write the recipe and walk away. Or if you want to be super hands-on, you can. But you should just try it. And uh, I said, yeah. Okay. And who was that? His name is John Davidson. Uh -huh. He's, I worked with him before. I washed dishes for him when he owned a restaurant in Dundee called huh. Tina's. Huh. He was one of the co-owners there, one of the founders of that restaurant, which is still in business uh -huh. and very good. Um, but uh, so yeah, John's known me ever since I was a young young feller. Uh -huh. And uh, so I, you know, made wine with him, and it's much different making wine on your own terms than it is just sort of dragging hoses for somebody else, so that was, oh, there's, this, this is a creative field. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, there's more to it than just, uh, dishwashing, which is basically all winemaking is when you come down on, down to it. Um, and then the, the, the market and the Montessori school materials got very soft after 9-11, People were pulling their kids out of private school because, you know, the economy went south. Yeah. And uh, so this was another one of those times when I needed some pocket money. Uh huh. And I came back and I worked for Dad for the harvest of 2002. And then that winter, somebody called Dad up and said, "I have a client who's looking for a vineyard manager. Do you happen to know anybody who's available?" Is that the way that worked? Yeah, it was that it was it was like a <clears throat> they were some sort of like executive recruitment firm up in Portland and they were completely at sea wow. as to how to find somebody to manage a vineyard. Uh-huh. And I don't know how you knew those people. She was an old Irie customer or something and she just called you up. Who was that? I forgot her name. I could look it up, but uh he says, Yeah, I do as a matter of fact, my son, you know. I, I'm struggling along again. This is another one of those times we uh -huh. you know. 
we didn't have another baby on the way at that point, but <laughs> and uh, so you just have one. We have two now. Oh, two. Yeah. Um, I wait till periods of stable uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wait till periods of stable employment to have children, I said. Um, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I went to met, uh, manage this small vineyard called Bishop Creek, and that was a blast as well. It's uh -huh. really um, interesting little vineyard. It's 12 acres and 15 different little blocks like four different kinds of rootstocks uh, of wow. seven different clones, you know, kind of spread amongst Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris. Um, uh, four different row spacings, about Holy three different God. orientations. So it was like having my own little research vineyard. Yeah. And, and it so... It was what? It was about 12 acres. It was 12 he acres, was, yeah. He was making a gazillion dollars doing it. Is that right? No. <laughs> no, I was making I was making a good salary. But what happened there that that made it into a very good salary was that um this wine that I'd made with John Davidson, um, uh, you know, he'd given me the option either to go ahead and sell it, uh, you know, get get licensed and go ahead and sell it, or, you know, if I didn't want to do that that he would just take it back and mix it into uh you know, on one of his own cuvées. Uh huh. Uh, a very no pressure operation, but of course, you know, once I'd had made this wine and it tasted good, I was pretty excited to put it on the market. So uh, that's when I developed sort of my own label called Black Cat. Uh -huh. And the people I, I I was working with um, came up with this great arrangement that allowed me to sort of sell Black Cap through their license and, and at their tasting room in Portland. Uh huh. And uh, so that was a Terrific win-win for both of us. And yeah. So I continued to do Black Cap in 2003, 2004, and I'm still doing it now. I brought it with me when I came back here. Uh huh. And so what brought you back here? Dad asked me. <laughs> and how come you asked him? What was the the motive? I think he's good. Uh huh. And he's fun to be around. Is he? When I have a chance to talk to him. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. So you guys get along all right now. We do. You know, one of the things that... I mean, first of all, before that time, it was always me asking him. Or, you know, Jason, you know, Crush is coming and I need extra help. Can you come help out for Crush? Yeah. But this was the first time he'd ever said, yeah, I want you to come here and work and manage the vineyards and make the wine. It was a huge, huge, huge step, and, and uh, you know, just something I couldn't say no to. And then, you know, also there's the matter of his health, you know, which uh, isn't doesn't seem to be getting worse, but it doesn't seem to be getting better either. So, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to I wanted to be here to help with that too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if if he was if you were still in perfect health, Dad, I would have said no. Really? Because uh, you just have, you just, you know, love this work too much. There's something to that. I get bored easily. Mm -hmm. And also this is, uh, Irie has been your job and your hobby and your mistress <laughs> and, uh, you know, your sports car. <laughs> and, uh, your midlife crisis, and then your late life, you know, just e everything that wasn't uh, sort of immediately what was happening in your family was work. And so, um, it's, Learn it, from it's that. part of your blood. I don't think, I, I did, <laughs> or I'm trying to. <laughs> What's that lesson? The lesson is that balance is good, you know. Yeah. Uh, though I find when I started here I was making it my goal to get home by 5.30 I could start it as early as I wanted to in the morning but I had to be home by 5.30 because of kids and stuff you, kids, you saw yeah. the commitment right and then and then at uh, 5.30 just wasn't doable you know I finally get everybody out of here at 5 and I have a half an hour to do the work that I've been trying to get to all day long 
So then it moved to 6. And now it moved to 6.30. Uh -huh. And these days, if I get home by 6.35, I'm feeling like I did okay. And I'm hoping it's not going to ease towards 7. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was thinking the other day as I was driving home at 6.30, 6.30, that's the time that Dad always really tried to get home by and often huh. couldn't, you know, make it home by then. So uh, I hope I can learn a lesson, but, man, you know, there are real issues to deal with, and I'm dealing with the same issues you did. It's just that one issue, <laughs> that one bucket full of gunk that's sitting there as you're turning off the lights to walk out. And you're like, ah, why did X, Y, or Z leave that bucket of gunk there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So, Jason, for you, you know, it's like you, you kind of walk in on, like, this, this history. Mm -hmm. um, no, I didn't walk in on it. I'm part of it. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. But I mean, other um, people walk in on it. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. But I mean, you know, and now you're kind of what? Like, uh, I'm not sure what analogy to use. Like, you're taking the mantle, or you're, you know, it's like you're, you're kind of walking that path now. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, is it a burden to have like that history, or is it a blessing, or? Well, I, I think it's both. Um, you know, I have to admit that I have a certain amount of jealousy for the people my age who uh, can sort of, you know, have the pleasure of that, um, oh, what's that writer's name, who used to write all the rags of riches stories, um, right around the turn of the century. Oh, um, to me. Um, I, I know who you mean. Yeah, Horatio Alger. Yeah. That Horatio Alger It's very much part of the American dream, you know. Oh, and so you're seeing building it yourself. other people. Um, oh, 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 building this the yeah. the empire or building. Well, like, just just building just building a, a business that you know, being an entrepreneur in a really classic sense. And so like, coming into this, I mean, here we have a small business that's very entrepreneurial, but which has its history, and 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 you know, which you can't necessarily react the way an entrepreneur would by saying, oh, I'm just gonna throw out all of this and. Start over again, or you know, whatever. So, mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you know, I've got, I I would say the best vineyards in the state to, to work with. You know, I've got a crew of people who are trained uh, 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 to the nines and who teach me new stuff every day. You know, who've been with us for decades. Uh, I've got this guy's knowledge to draw on. Um, I've got a, a, a working facility. Or a working museum, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I also have a, a lot of advantages that other people do. So, you know, if, if I were to spend any time feeling sorry for myself, I would be the only person because nobody's going to feel sorry for me. It's uh, a pretty sweet no, game. I was just. <laughs> I was just saying to Janos, there are probably a lot of people in this business that envy you. Oh, I, I know there are, because, you know, sometimes I'll be griping about something, and I'll just look at me like, are you knocking butts? <laughs> <laughs> because... Because, you know, I'm, I'm now where they want to be, and maybe they don't recognize... Um, I have a style of wine that, you know, I make with Black Cap that represents, I don't think it's the, the best vision of Pinot Noir. It's just a, a way to do it, mm -hmm. you know. And it's based on Dad's philosophies about, you know, not monkeying around, not using additions uh, to make wine, you know, not sort of like a, 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 a cookbook winemaking, but more like soup pot winemaking, where you have the grapes and then you start throwing in a bunch of other stuff on top. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, growing grapes sustainably, using unrooted grapes, avoiding irrigation, um, uh, you know, working in concert with nature both in the vineyard but also in the winery. These are all like these really core philosophical issues that Dad and I share. Uh -huh. And stylistically, there are tiny little tweaks that, you know, I, I did with Black Cap that wouldn't be true to the Irish style. And so, for me, right now, the dialogue is, what is the Irish style? 
what is the David Lett style? Are those two things absolutely synonymous? You know, um, so yeah, for me, it's just trying to figure out, um, you know, what Irie means uh, beyond those philosophical uh, sort of underpinnings that we, the, that foundation we share. Just the, the stylistic sort of flourishes over the top. What does that mean? Uh huh. So. So glad to have you aboard. Well, you know, I I don't think I if I wanted I don't think I could make wine exactly like you do if I wanted to, did. Well, I don't think do. any two winemakers. I think you could give two winemakers the same grapes, the same recipe, the same yeast, the same equipment, and they would probably make two different wines. You can ask for a lot, but not my mistress. <laughs> Your mistress. <laughs> <laughs> That was some analogies that he was playing on early on. He was oh, talking really? about. Also, yeah. I didn't come up with the mistress thing. That's good. I'm glad I didn't enjoy that <laughs> in the conversation.